Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Board Game Mechanics. I'm Katie, and with me, as always, is... Hey, everybody, what's going on? It is Jason. And we're back from vacation. We didn't even want to come back, so we took even longer to do this week's episode. <laughs> yeah, we have vacation brain. Drunk on the, the sharks and the jellyfish. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, we were at the beach. It was gorgeous. Weather was gorgeous. I got stung by a jellyfish. Um, that was not fun. I got pooped on by a seagull. Also not fun. We saw a shark. Cool, but also kind of scary. And we saw a bunch of dolphins and birds. Like, it was just a nice, relaxing vacation with our kids. A long, long drive um, from us to the south. But it was good. It was really good. But we're glad to be back, as always. And now in Ohio, it is sweater weather. It is fall, and it's my favorite season. Yeah, I do like it, except I have a couple concerts that are outside. So that could be a little chilly. But I would prefer the chilly over sweating. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> I love fall. Fall in Ohio is so great. Um the cool temperatures and like it's just perfect to snuggle under a blanket with a book and the windows open and a hot cup of tea or I like my cider cold I will die on that hill people that like their cider all warmed up and crap I can't stand that I can't I don't like chai either no I don't do those flavors I just don't like my friend is like you don't like warm spices like cinnamon or nutmeg or clove no I don't which is weird because I love fall and those all things are fall. Can't do it. Just eating regular. I, lo- I love the warm. I love the warm spices, I but I don't want my apple cider warm either. I like it. Cold. Yeah, cold cider. I just want a cold apple with maybe some caramel dip. That's where it's at. I'm not a pumpkin spice person, although I love pumpkin pie, but pumpkin pie with like almost no clove, hardly any nutmeg or cinnamon or ginger. <laughs> it's very specific. It's a very specific idea. But we're here. I'm ready for fall. Fall is football season. All of those. It's just like all my favorite things happen in the fall. Camp out. Yep. I like the weather. That's for sure. Campfires. It's good. Anyway, none of that. Also, it's cool. And so it's nice to be inside playing some board games. And there are some really interesting new games coming out. So I want to talk about them. Now I hunted all over a couple different sites. Backer kit, um, game found, but all the ones today are from Kickstarter. Just because those are the ones that struck my fancy, I guess. The first one is actually not even a full game. It's an expansion. Although you can get the full game through this Kickstarter. And that is Clinic Deluxe the biohazard expansion. So according to the the creator, um, Alban Vayard, this is the final expansion. This is it. And so what he said he wanted to do with the final expansion was to make it concerned about the waste <laughs> that the patients produce. So it's all about the biohazard waste that is produced by patients in a clinic, in your hospital, um, using the janitors and how you have to move it around. There really aren't a ton of explanation of the rules. I saw a picture of the rules and I tried to zoom in on it and I couldn't read it. But there's clinic is a really good game. Like the idea of running a hospital and moving patients around is awesome. What I don't understand about clinic is I think there are how many expansions? Too many is the answer. There, there are a lot, a lot of extensions, I call it. So the first extension Ha- includes like janitors and then um like there's the base game the extension then there's five extensions there's a COVID-19 one there's a campaign and then now we have the biohazard um just clinic the base game is so beefy I don't even know what you do with the extensions I think my mind would explode let alone playing with all of them. I think the campaign will be really cool to kind of like evolve um, the clinic that you're you're working with. But whew, there's a ton. There's just so much stuff in the base game. But I think the idea of of dealing with like the full gamut of what happens to patients from input from triage to helping them, and then now to this whole biohazard thing, I think is really awesome. 
So if you like Clinic or if you've never played Clinic, you you can also uh, use this Kickstarter to go back and get the different versions of the Clinic. Um, so if you like Clinic or if you've never played it before, you can also go through this Kickstarter and get the base game um, and all the billions of extensions. Also, um, another one of Albin's games, Small City, you can get through this too. So I would check this Kickstarter out. There's six days left on it. And just the Biohazard expansion is $19, which is super reasonable. Yeah, the price point's good. But then again, if you bought Clinic, the other 47 expansions, you're looking at like, I don't know, $600, $700 invested in this game. Yeah. The all level, all in level is 259 euros, which. That's for, that's for everything? I think so. Wow, that's not bad. All right. Yeah. Still, I mean, that's a lot of money for one game, though. For everything. And I, I mean, we played it just the base game. We have one extension, and I don't even know if I'd ever even need to play that because the base game is super crunchy. There's so much going on. I mean, I guess if you play this game once a week, maybe you'll like all the stuff, but. I, I don't understand it. That's a lot. Well, and it could be, I mean, I guess if you are in the healthcare field, some of the ex- the expansions um, pull on certain things in the field that you're like, oh, I'm really interested in, you know, in the ER or in, you know, maybe the janitorial staff or whatever. So certain expansions might speak to you and maybe you would play with those, but just the base game is a ton. And I really enjoy it. I would play it again, but I think there's so much going on with what's there, I can't even imagine adding, adding all those extensions. So, same. Definitely something to look at. Another game that we already kind of have a background with, but this is actually a separate standalone game, and that is called Sagrada Artisans. So, this is a really interesting kind of take on Sagrada. So, you still got the stained glass windows and the dice. However, this is kind of a roll and write version plus a legacy version. Which is really interesting. So there's like, you are um, like, a, each person is like a competing f- stained glass maker family. You know how that works, the whole stained glass mafia situation. Um, so your family is going to construct these cathedral windows over this campaign. Um, and the game does change in this legacy version, which I think is really interesting. So it has a roll and write feel where you're going to roll these dice and that's going to allow you to actually color in parts of the window that you're working on for that particular game. There's also like paths that you can use where you're like maybe gaining wisdom or gaining skills, um, tools of the trade. Those all are kind of developing as you play. You can customize dice um, with numbers and colors to kind of strengthen your family's particular design. Um, You're constructing this cathedral, and as you construct the cathedral through, like, in-game choices, you're, like, getting new powers unlocked. Your tool tool cards will evolve as you play play the different games. So how the tools are used and what they do changes over time, which I think is really interesting. So they're become more valuable, but they're also more fragile, which I think is a cool thematic piece. So there's a lot of kind of different stuff going on here. Another really interesting thing I think that's happening with this game is they have mentioned that um, they know that, you know, visible accessibility is a problem. So with this game, they've actually added textures for the different colors. So if you're colorblind, some of our dear friends are, there's going to be, there's textures that accompany each color that can help you identify them separately which I think is awesome. And it's about freaking time that they did that. Like, I think it's a great idea. Um, There's a ton of stuff that you can get through this Kickstarter, this gorgeous dice tower. Um, There's a campaign reset kit. There's a a window pattern booster pack. So you can do even more window patterns um, with the game, even after you've played through the legacy. There's a coloring contest. I mean, they're really doing some different stuff here that I think is really cool. Um, and you're you're pulling like a game with you get your story deck. Everybody gets a new window. You're rolling your dice and putting them on the cathedral board. Then you're using those dice out there to color in um, different spaces that, as you draft them. 
to like meet your objectives for your window, much like regular Sagrada. And then you're gaining these tools and abilities that carry forward the more as you play the different games through the campaign. It's 10 windows that you're doing um, throughout the game. And then there's the whole uh, booster pack as well that's actually included with the basic Kickstarter. So you can play windows separately from the campaign. So if you like Sagrada, if you like coloring, if you like puzzly things, if you wanted to play Sagrada but are colorblind, now is your chance. Check it out. There's six days left on this Kickstarter, and um, Sagrada Artisans is $75 for the basic pledge. Yeah, it sounds cool. I just, when I think of a game that needs a legacy version, I don't think of Sagrada, but apparently somebody thought of it and thought we needed it so yeah i would play it I, I probably wouldn't buy it but i would play it yeah at first i thought oh a legacy version of sagrada like how'd you do that but i think the way they've done it thematically is actually really interesting how like tools increase because your experience increase so they're more powerful but they also are more fragile so you can't use them as much like i think those ideas and concepts are really interesting um so it looks it it's more than what i thought it would be actually yeah, that's cool. Okay, so the next game is brand new and yet feels not brand new. Um, so the next game is called The Fox Exper- Experiment. This is um, being produced by Pandasaurus, who I adore. And it is designed by Elizabeth Hargreaves. Hargraves? Hargreaves? Hargrave, I think. Hargrave. She's not from the Umbrella Academy. I know. So that's why I get confused. I get confused if it's, if it's un- uh, Umbrella Academy or like... I get. I want to make her name like Vanessa Redgrave, so we get Hargrave. I don't know. I, all these things going through my head when I say her name. But she did Wingspan, which I enjoy. But this game is about foxes. Imagine that. It's called the Fox Experiment. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of um, crap. I forgot the name of the game. Uh, nope. Nope. J- mm, j- Gino? No. The one with I, the pea plants? Yeah, genotype. Genotype. Okay, I was like on genome, I was on genetics, I was on Gregor Mendel. I tried to name this game everything. It is very much like genotype, I think. But instead of creating pea plants like Gregor Mendel did initially, you are working with foxes and you're actually breeding them to pass on certain traits. So you like select some fox parents that have traits you want to pass on. There's some almost roll and write stuff because you're rolling these trait dice and seeing what you get um, and uh, marking on these cards what traits come up and to make new fox pups. And then the pups that you create, like they're trying to match up in some studies that you're choosing to complete. And uh, then those pups then go and can become future parents that you could possibly use um, to make new ones. The Probably best thing about this game is the fox meeples <laughs> that come with the basic basic retail version. There are 40 wooden fox meeples. They're cool. There are um, 80 like unique dice. Well, 16 per type. There's wooden player markers with these really cool gears. I love good bits. Y'all know that. Um I, I always think that these genetic games are interesting. I don't think it's anything super new. Um, but it's got the dry erase markers. You're working on the study cards. You're marking the pup cards. It has a solo version as well. Um, I, I think the, those present interesting puzzles. I have a problem with foxes because I'm an avid reader of like Lewis and and um, Redwall, and often that the foxes, and and I live in a farming community, so foxes can be bad guys. (laughs) When I know that they're not, like, all around, like, I just have a negative concept of foxes, which is stupid. I get it. But I don't think it'll diminish this game. And it does look pretty good. I Again, I really like genotype. I like trying to solve that puzzle of getting traits and what gets passed on and, and doing that. And so this looks like a fun little game. So... The Fox Experiment, there's seven days left on the Kickstarter. And the Retail Pledge, which also comes with the adorable Fox Meeples, is $55. I mean, I like Wingspan. That's all I've ever played. I like foxes. I like genotype. So could be cool. Yeah, sounds good. The last one I have to talk about is like a departure 
uh, from a lot of my usual games, and yet it's not. So this game is called Black Oot. Black Oot. Black, Black Oot. I, I can't say it because it's if, if I were Canadian, it would make it would sound better. Uh, is it actually a Canadian game? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, that makes sense. So Black Black Oot, Blackout, basically, is a drunken detective board game. And normally, I'm not advocating for drunkenness in any form, but this game touts itself as Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective meets The Hangover, and I, I can't. I can't walk away from that. So what happens is you were blackout drunk and you now are going back to figure out what happened during that time. So you use your phone. So it's kind of, it's, it's app based and you're through the phone and the app for the game. You basically get the phone of the character in the mystery so you can look at their text, um, like their social media feeds, their photos, and a bunch of other apps to figure out who you met and where you went on your blackout night. So you have a map and you're like, look, you're going to talk to people to see what they know. And you're trying to piece together a timeline of events. So there's a board like six. It's it's like a it's a hybrid digital board game. So you print like the map, which is six pages that you just tape together, and then you use your phone's web browser. It says iOS or Android. Oh, it's without having to download an app. So it's just through the web browser. And it says, you know, if you're a fan of escape room or a consulting detective or D&D or whatever, that this is for you. So you're just trying to figure out every place you stumbled to whilst you were blackout. So you're, you got the synthetic phone, so you're working through the mystery, you're um, going around this place called Icy Basin to talk to people, unlocking memories, everything, you know, things can change with the different mysteries, like how many places you go, and um, you have to unlock a certain number of mandatory memories to win. And, and I, I just think... That sounds like an interesting game, like, because it's consulting detective, like, where it's like, okay, we have to follow these leads and talk to these people. And if I said I was here, like, I was at the icy basin for the university, where people like to party, you know, who would I have talked to? Like, where would I have gone after that? To try and like piece it together on the map? Um, what friends that you talk to? All of that stuff. I just... And, and to use your phone and to – but by using your phone, you also act like you're seeing the player's phone. I think that that's a cool concept too. So if you like Canadian games, if you like games about being drunk, if you like detective stories, check out Blackout. There's 12 days left on the Kickstarter and uh, it's $8. I like the price. The price is good. <laughs> the name is hilarious. It's like, you know, a funny joke. I love it. But yeah, probably not something I would play. But the price is amazing. I will say that. I like it. So if if the price is amazing, can I actually get it? I need to look at it. Like for what do you get for eight bucks? There's like you get is it is it all print and play stuff? Yeah, you print out the map and then you use your, your phone to um go to like the website on your like safari or whatever oh i got you i got you all right i'm looking at it right now okay you can also create your own character on some of these and design your own business it's interesting i love it oh canadians you're great they're all right they're okay <laughs> i don't I, I think there are multiple ones to play i'm not i hope it's not just one mystery i guess i didn't really see that I mean, it's eight dollars. Well, that's that's true. Maybe it is only one play, because apparently it's about John 19, John's nineteenth birthday adventure, which is the base mystery. Oh, and then there's Black Oot Two, mystery two. Yeah, it looks like looks like there's two of them. Okay, which for us in the states, like John's nineteenth birthday adventure is like crazy because the drinking age in the states is twenty one. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, all that's kinds true. of things with Black Oot, the board game. Um, so yeah. If you're interested in that, check it out. And that's all I have for news.
All right, so let's talk about a couple games that we played. We were on vacation, so we didn't get a lot of gaming done. But we did manage to play one that's been sitting on the shelf for, I don't know, years, <laughs> probably. And it was, it's a beast. Yeah, it was deep on the shelf of shame. Yeah, deep on the shelf. It's uh, hard to learn, hard to understand, hard to play. Um, just, yeah, just big. And it's called Feudum. So we did manage to play a game of Feudum. Uh, and we played it. <laughs> you have to give a brief <laughs> overview of the game. Okay, so a brief overview. Let's try it. So in Feudum, what you're trying to do is you are trying to gain, to control these six different guilds. That's the gist of the game. You're going to get a ton of points by doing that. And each of these guilds have guild master, journeyman, and apprentice spots that players can get based on how much influence they have in each guild. If you have influence in a guild, you have access to push. If you're the guild master, you have access to pull. If you're the journeyman or the apprentice. And what that means is it's going to take stuff from your guild either out of it or pull stuff into it to get points. That's all it means. Um, and the way that that works is you have a, some action cards. You're going to pick four or five action cards depending on some other stuff. And then you're going to play that card on your turn. And it's going to help you get pawns out on the board, which increases your influence. You're going to move around the board, setting up um, like ruling different um cities, farms, outposts, turning them into feudums. If you turn stuff into feudums, then you have to fight other people because the king expects you to be a good vassal for him and fight. Um, there's monsters that can come out on the board. There's different shipping routes that you can take. Tons of movement. Um, there's money that we didn't really use a ton. Influence tokens, which are really hard to come by, which you get from one of the guilds. Everything is interconnected and tight and hard and really tricky to understand because there's rules upon rules upon rules. But despite all that, I kind of like the the experience. I'd like to play it again. Maybe it would be, you know, now that we understand it a little bit more, it might go a little smoother and be a little, little better. But it was okay. I was wanting it to be a little bit more, but again, it was okay. So how did you feel about Feudum? Yeah, I, I would play it again. Mostly because I'm like, okay, I went through all the rules. I need a payoff for going through all these rules because there there were a ton. Um, because of a ton of rules, I felt like some things were convoluted. Like we talked about how it would be nice if they got Uncle Vital to design this game um, because there's some actions that really would be nice if you could get a follow action on because you just don't have enough time to do everything that needs to be done um, and get anywhere. And I I am okay with games that really push you to make the most of your turns. But this reminds me of how I felt about, um, oh my gosh, my brain. The game where you're laying down all these different tiles. I think it's like Irish or Celtic in some ways themed. Um. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. What you don't know what I'm talking Do we about have this game. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I thought we brought Chris's copy, where it seems like you're never going to cover up a whole island or anything. It's like exercise in futility. I yeah, I have no. Yes, idea. you you know we just oh. Anyway, it feels like this other game where you're supposed to cover up all the spaces on like these different. Oh oh oh! You're talking about um, Feast for Odin. Yes, yes, Feast for yes, Odin. Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah. Nordic, it wasn't at all. Catholic. Yeah, I was like, it's it's not Celtic. I couldn't, That's what I was like th- trying to think. <laughs> I got it confused. I mixed it together in my head with the the a different monk and beer one. That's also Heaven and Ale, which is also feels oh yeah feels very hard, but not in the same way. Um, so it reminds me of Feast for Odin, and it's like there's no possible. You're supposed to do this. Like the game kind of tells you you're supposed to do this, but you're never going to do it. And like. The game is called Feudum, so I feel like you should make Feudums. But actually, I made only one Feudum, and it seemed like the worst decision I ever made in the game because it puts all these other like responsibilities on there. And I don't, I actually felt like I could have made more points if I didn't. Um, cause I, I had one seal and I could have used it differently, and I would have gotten, I think, a lot more points that way because I lost points for my Feudum because I didn't fight anybody. But again, it was two players, so I didn't really feel a need to fight anybody. And I was making points in my own way, which I, I do love. But then I don't understand why it's called Feudum if really making Feudums is not good, it seems. 
Yeah, I mean, you got to go at it early, I think, and then. But you don't have enough stuff to go on it early. Time. Like it just, you just can't. Yeah. I don't, That's true. I don't know. I would like to give it another go. I feel like there are some ways to streamline. You could have streamlined the rules and made um, the game more fun. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I love the quirky artwork. I think that's really great. I wish there was a much better um, theme because a stronger theme would help you tie in the teaching of the rules and gameplay, I think, on this because it is so overwhelming. This The amount of rules reminded me of a Feaster game, but after you play like so, a couple rounds of an Alexander Feaster game, you're like, okay. Now I see how all those rules work and make sense. Got it. Feudum, every time I'm like, how the frick am I supposed to do this? Like for everything, almost the whole time. And I'm like, oh, wait, I've been doing, I get these rules, but I really need to be doing all these other things. But I don't think I can do all those other things. So I really have to feed my people and do these. <sighs> so right now it's a mixed bag. I could easily see this game getting traded away. Yeah. I One, we're never going to get a play it that much because it's a beast. The teach is awful. Like, it's absolutely miserable. And I'd, unlike a Vito game where teaching is also a beast, those games actually make sense and are fun. Yeah. Like, they have a lot of stuff going on. They make sense. The actions work well together. This one, for all the teaching that went into it, it didn't pay off as much for me. So, yeah, I can, I can see it being traded for sure. If anybody wants it because it's like a... You know, a mixed bag of people love it, people hate it. So yeah, if, you're, if anyone's looking for a copy of Feudum, please send us a private message. We'll help you out. Yeah, uh, and the next game we played is the complete opposite of what Feudum is, <laughs> and it has a really adorable little theme, and it is called My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game, and this is a cooperative deck building game from Renegade, set in the My Little Pony cartoon universe well the, specifically uh, the equestria universe which is the newer yeah. ponies right friendship is magic and all that stuff yes um so what you're doing is you're taking on the role of one of the ponies i think there's six to choose from yes and it's a one to four player game so you're going to have one or f up to four of the ponies in play each pony has their own special little ability they each get their own individual card in their deck but then everybody else has the same nine cards so Everybody have a deck of 10, but one that's a little different. And what you're trying to do is you are playing a deck building game, which means you use your crappy cards to get better cards. And you're trying to use those cards to get sugar cubes, get tokens to help defeat these hurdles that you have. There will be three of them that you have to defeat. And then ultimately the end game card, which I don't know what those are called. A goal. It's the final goal. The goal. Uh, yeah, end game goal to win the game. Or if you can't defeat the end game card, you lose the game. So everybody's kind of playing together uh, their own game, but when you go to fight the hurdles and the in-game co goals, you can work together and pull your resources and all that kind of thing. There's also some locations you can visit uh, that let you like basically change stuff into other things, spend resources to do certain types of actions, and those will come in and out as they get fulfilled and all that. So it's a uh, it's kind of a basic deck builder, but the way that some of the other things work is pretty cool. And the My Little Pony theme is classic, so. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. So what did you think of this one? I mean, Jason's a total brony, so this is like right up his alley. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not I'm not even gonna I'm not even ashamed of it. <laughs> um I this reminds me, and I had mentioned this to Jason when we played, it feels like um the Harry Potter, like the Hogwarts battle game. Is is it called Hogwarts Battle or is it Battle for Hogwarts or is it uh whatever. E Either way, I'm not sure exactly the how it goes. The deck building one of the Harry Potter games. Because you're fighting, like, how you fight, like, these different Death Eaters. It's how you're doing these little hurdles. You're working together. You're able to kind of pass around resources to help each other out. Um, you're buying new cards from the deck. And then you've got kind of, like, a final boss to defeat. The interesting thing about this is they have make different ways to like up the difficulty as you play. They've got some cards that are like situations that arise that can come out in your adventure row, which reminds me of like the monsters and events that show up in Clank. And, you know, you have to work to defeat them. There's a constant timer going that these clouds show up on your hurdles. 
Um, and once you hit the hurdle maximum, all the clouds start going on your final end goal, which is kind of scary. Um, cause you got it, you need to defeat it. And there's some chaos involved, which I think is really interesting. Like thematically, they did such a good job with this. Um, the, the hard thing is like our daughter really, our youngest daughter really wanted to play it cause she likes my little pony. Um, and straight out the gate, it was just too hard for her. So I'm trying to help her. Like I realized that we had never played a deck builder with her. So we brought out summer camp um, to try to help her understand deck builders, which would give her at least a basic level um, to get into this game. Cause it, it is difficult. Um, we made some bad yeah, the, choices. The, th- the three resources make it hard too. Yeah. There's three different types of sugar cubes. Um, that you need to collect. You need different colors and different amounts of them for the hurdles and the end goal. Also, there's different types of resources that you can buy cards with and spend. So it's really like diversified. It's not just like, oh, here's points and here's here's buy power, here's fighting power like you have with Clank, which maybe we should play that with her to help her understand an excellent deck builder. Even summer camp is just you have stuff to buy cards and you have movement. So yeah, so this is yeah. like mo- there's more than that going on in this, and yeah, it is kind of difficult. And we kind of made mistakes at the beginning and picked I think the wrong ponies to be because um, I didn't know because each pony has a unique power that you get as well, asymmetric power, and there are some that actually give you sugar cubes, which were vital, um, and we didn't have any of those. <laughs> And my character, you actually, to use her special power, had to give up a sugar cube, which was the opposite of where I wanted to go. They already have an expansion in the works for this, which I think is just going to be more cards. And the cards are really interesting because there are some that work, like they have text that work for particular pony characters, which is cool. And then they also, but they also have those different types of currency that you can use in different ways during the game. So there's just a lot of stuff going on in this game. And uh, I enjoyed it. Is it is it overtaking some of my favorite deck builders? Probably not. But I think it is fun. And I think it's worth keeping and even getting expansions for. And eventually, yes, it'll be something our, our girls will like to play. Um, or anyone that likes my MLP. Like, this is a decent game to, like, bring out if you like deck building. So, um, yeah, it was pretty good. I liked it. Yeah, I definitely want to get that expansion. Just having more cards would be cool. Maybe some different ponies and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like it. It's fun. And you can play a solo too, which is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming, I don't know how that works. I didn't look at it, but it seems like it would be just like the regular game, just less ponies. Yeah, you're doing some different stuff with it. There's a And it's it's not a ton different. So it's just a really small section in the, in the rules at the back that tells you how to play solo. So... All right, so those are the games we played. Let's go to the feature. All right, so we are back to our what's on the shelf. We have started a new shelf, and this is kind of a funny shaped shelf because we have um, like smaller little like cube shelves that we stacked on top of regular shelves. Our game room is like a Tetrisy jumbly kind of puzzle because we're just trying to keep all the games we can in a decent order. So this shelf happens to be a completely Japanese themed shelf. And so I really, really love it. Some of my favorite games, some of my Japan made games are on here, but the first one on the shelf is personal favorite of mine. Um, that is Japanese themed and it's not from Japan anime. Right, this is from um, Emperor S Nine, isn't it? Uh, no, Studio H. Um, so this is from Studio H, and it's called Hagakure, and I believe I have talked about it at least once before, if not more times, because Hagakure is a trick taking game, and I really love trick taking games because I'm from the Midwest, and we are euchre people around here. We play hearts and spades, and um, we just love trick-taking games. And Hagakure is a trick-taking game, which is why I love it. What's really cool about Hagakure is there are only two suits. There are townspeople and there are samurai. Which you think is like, oh, that makes it easy. It doesn't. It doesn't make it easy. Your samurai are your trump uh, suit, so they will overtake regular um, citizens. 
But you've got your samurai um, have numbers. So again, like the highest number is going to win. Um, Trump will defeat non-Trump. But if I lead with, let's say, a townsperson, somebody else doesn't have to follow that suit. They could lay a samurai. So it's just like you you bet – you can kind of bet on yourself a little bit because you've got these four. Oh, my gosh. I did a whole written review on this. Y'all should check out my trick-taking written review. I believe it's on our website um, where I explain hug curry in depth. Um, but you've got these little tokens that you're using like, oh, I'm going to bet. I think I can get double. I'm going to double my score because I think I'm going to get a lot this turn. This turn. Or I want to switch my hand with the kitty because I think my cards stink and the kitty has got to be better than this. Or I want to look at somebody else's hand. Or I want to get a zero because if you don't, collect at least one trick, you get negative points. Um, the artwork is gorgeous and adorable and I love it. It's a great tricky taking game. I've played this with lots of people who are non-gamers, but again, are from the Midwest and like card games. And the th- it's a simple game. It's a simple trick taking game. One person lays, we all follow suit or not. The decisions though are so like, Sometimes you're like, ah, what am I going to play? What are you going to play? How am I going to get the points? Am I going to get the points? I love that. I love that. And so uh, the first game on our shelf is Hagakure. Yeah, good game. Good game for sure. All these games are actually pretty good, except for maybe one. <laughs> um, but the next one in on the shelf is actually a base game and expansion all in one box because the expansion basically is just more cards to use in the game. And this is called Heart of Crown and Heart of Crown Fairy Garden. And I think we also have the Far East Princess expansion as well. There's one other little expansion that we have for it. Um, and effectively what this game is, deck building game. And you are in the first, it's a, a deck building game over two fa- two halves kind of. In the first half, you're just acquiring cards like normal, trying to get better cards than your starting cards earning cards that are worth points, all that kind of thing. And then in the second half, you're going to be backing one of the princesses to help them become the new, like, leader. Ruler, queen. Ruler, queen, yes. And uh, you, then you're going to be putting, you're playing your princess down with a certain number of land cards, and you're trying to be the first player to get a certain number of points from the card you bought earlier tied to that princess to score the to to win the game. So the first is building up, the second is a race to get those cards actually played to the princess to win the game. It's a, a pretty cool game. It has really nice art, none of the like risque stuff that we're going to talk about later. It has good um just cute art. Um it has a cool arrow system when you play a card if it has an arrow either to the side or to the bottom, that's how you know you can play another card after it so it gives you like a a link if there's no arrows then you know you can't play any more action cards which is pretty cool um it it doesn't really do a ton of different stuff along the deck building lines except for that second half where you're trying to race to back the princess so it's cool i like it a lot we don't play it as much but i do enjoy it and that is heart of crown and heart of crown fairy garden yeah the artwork is really cool on this one and the arrows like make it so you don't have to remember action points um, right. Which I think is helpful. Like you might have to do later. Yes. Like in a different game that's underneath this one on the shelf. <laughs> and you know, I have been a heavy proponent of this game. And that's Tanto Kore. Tanto Kore is also a deck building game. Um, in this game, however, instead of, you know, backing a princess and doing things like that, you are actually running a household, a household and you're using different maids to accomplish some work. And really what you're going to do is you want to eventually chamber those maids. They will go to the private quarters because they're going to gather points for you. It's a basic race for points. The thing that I really love about Tonto is the cards work together so well. So for me, that's one of the kind of flaws of Heart of Crown. I love the idea. I love that whole gathering really good cards and then backing a princess kind of thing and then how it changes the game to a second phase. But for me, sometimes if you don't have the right layout of cards in the market, they don't fire off quite well. And you've got cards you can't really do anything with. I don't find that in Tonto Quarry. Um, I think the cards really work together well. You're trying to get – there are some maids that actually are negative points unless they are chambered. So you're kind of working to get those out somehow. You do have to remember action points because you need uh, – they're called service. 
Um, you need so much service in order to play maids as well as chamber maids. Um, and so maids can allow you, can give you points of service. They can give you a love for which to acquire new maids, um, or they can let you draw cards. So lots of different things happening. And the other interesting thing about Tantra Quarry is the base game is fun. Um, some of the artwork can be questionable. I'll just lay that out right now. Um, yeah, can be. Some of them aren't questionable. (laughs) That's true. There are some of them that are just regular maids, but some of them are a little risky. Yes. Like when she's hanging out on the pillows. And yes. All that stuff. So this is anime themed, very much has that kind of um, some boobalicious maids, some awkward positioning, um, which is why it has traditionally been a favorite of like creeps, like that board game brawl dude or whatever. Well, he's. He's where he needs to be now. I said, so it's awesome. Notice I said creeps, which I knew from the beginning. He set off all my alarms and I was like, I'm never watching any of his videos. Anyway. So, yes. Which the other thing is the text is kind of small on the cards for no reason. Yeah, it's ridiculously small. So then you're staring <laughs> at the questionable maids trying to read the cards. But once you play it enough, then you kind of know, okay, this maid is to service. Okay, so I need to buy this one or whatever. It, it It is better, but that is definitely one of the flaws of Tonto. But it is a really good deck builder, I think. Yeah, I agree. And it's so good that I want to talk about an expansion. And the first expansion, I well, we, we have them all, so we'll get to it. But I believe the first one in the series of expansions is Expanding the House which is the one we're going to talk about next. And that is basically just more maids. Um, it just gives you more maids to incorporate into the base game to give you more variety, which is usually what the first expansion of a game does. More good stuff to keep you coming back, to keep it fresh and, you know, have some fun. So expanding the house just takes the base game, gives you more of what's good, and there you go. And you can play that. You can play expanding the house by itself. It comes with everything you need, I believe. I think it has everything you need in it, like love cards and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, first expansion, expanding the house. And since we love that expansion, we got another one. And the uh, other, the second expansion we have is Tonto Quarry Vacation. Now, the thing about vacation is you thought you'd see in scantily clad maids <laughs> until you take them to the beach. So the artwork on <sighs> vacation is by far the most NSFW. Like, I don't know what to say about it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but vacation kind of allows you to do different things. Um, you've got different types of maids that have different actions. Um, but in vacation, you can actually have like trips or I don't know if they call them events. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where you can encounters maybe. Yeah. Encounters, encounters. So you can go scuba diving or, um, go rafting or whatever. And so you're, instead of using your maid cards in the traditional way to keep points or to use the love to spend on more maids or to chamber, you can actually, um, go on an encounter and that gives you uh, different points as well. So it's, it's just kind of taking the regular Tonto and adding this extra, like, excursion piece to it i think that's right yeah yeah it just adds that one little new twist it might add some um, romantic vacation might, really it's called yeah it might give you um some events too. some of those purple cards i think they show up in this Is one for the first time first? yeah i don't know we don't play with those but they show up in one of these sets well we don't we sure. don't really play with vacation very often Oh, no. they're we'll they're reminisce cards. So oh, it's like yeah, you go on a romantic yeah. vacation and you do these different excursions, and then um, you reminisce about it. Like you have a campfire, or you watch the stars, or you have a picnic. So they give you like substantial victory points, but it's not like you can't buy them with love. You actually have to discard particular types of made cards from your hand. Um, so then you're kind of saying, okay, am I going to get? victory points through these reminisces or my victory points through like my made cards um, because the reminisces don't go actually into your deck. They go almost into like your chamber type thing. So romantic vacation just kind of adds a different way to get points that you didn't have before then. Yeah. And probably my favorite 
expansion. I, I don't know. Either first or second is the next one I'm talking about, and it is Oktoberfest. And the reason I love this, one reason alone, there's a deck of cards that's face down, and as some an action, you can go drink some beer. And you're going to flip some cards, flip a card from this deck, and it's going to have some kind of alcohol content on it. And you're, uh, it's done for a couple of reasons. One, you could pass out if you get too much alcohol. And two, you're trying to get certain kinds of beers to go with some of the other cards because you're doing like a set collection type thing. Like I may need to have a certain type of this ale or whatever. If I can get that, they're going to be with extra points at the end. And I, I love that this face down, all that stuff is random. So automatically draws me in, but I just, think it's funny that they've gone from the house to the beach now they're at oktoberfest and they're serving be- beer as beer winches now i don't know if that's the appropriate term but that's what i'm going to call them um and yeah I-, I-, I like this expansion a lot it's one that I- if i was going to pick one off the shelf i'd probably grab that one just for that deck alone and again you can mix all this stuff together so you could put the oktoberfest with the romantic vacation it doesn't matter but yeah i like that so tanto core oktoberfest yeah, this one also has like the disasters. So this is what you don't like. You like that you can actually have this pusher luck with these cards that come up out of the Oktoberfest deck. But um, then I could also like make your like beer tent collapse. Yeah, I hate that. Th- I hate in that. a storm. So Jason doesn't like the those mean cards. Uh, I just, it's not necessary. Just buy your cards and do better than me. You don't need to like mess with me. Well, doing better than me is the fact that I'm going to make your beer tent crash because you're getting too much beer. That could be good. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's I'm true. That's true. I mean, it, thematically, it makes sense. That doesn't mean I have to like it. No, and I know you don't. <laughs> um, and then the last expansion that we have, and I just noticed there was like another one, like Tokidoki Volleyball or something. W- I don't think that's necessarily that's a different game. Is it? It's called Tonto yes, Cory Toki Doki Volleyball. Yeah, it has nothing to do with this game though. Doki Doki Beach Volleyball, excuse me. Thank goodness. We don't have that one. But we do have Tonto Cory Winter Romance, which is the one I was most excited about. I believe we've talked about it on the show because it's the last one that came out and I was super excited because it includes dudes. That's right. We're about equality here. So, no, we, we don't just have maids. We now have butlers. And they're very, like, K-pop styled looking. They're, like, emo looking butlers. They're they cool. are. They're super emo looking butlers um, that are able to give you points. But also, you have butlers and maids so you can send everybody on dates i mean butlers can go on dates with butlers and maids and maids but you can have butlers and maids together everyone's going on dates and dates also give you points as well so that's like a whole another like way to decide to use your maids and your butlers to go to these like romantic meetup spots have couples um The way the cars interact with each other is really interesting in this one. This is by far my favorite. I think that the mechanisms are the most interesting. Um, The meetup spots give you points. There's just uh, a lot of really good stuff. This has, I think, the most um, non-shocking artwork, even the maids as well. So I like that a lot. And I, well, when you're going on a date, you do that with another player too, right? Yes. So you kind of yeah, and there's some cool. push your luck to that too, which I know you also like a lot. Yeah, yeah, I like that part. Okay, yeah. So when you go on a date in Winter Romance, I'm pretty sure that you like flip over other cards from your hand as part of the date, and th- there is a little push your luck element to that. We haven't played it for a while. Yeah, it's been a it's been a little bit, but I would say it's definitely my favorite one. There's also some bad things I think that can happen to you, like it's winter, so can't you get like fro- frostbite or something? Yeah, I'm not sure. There are some negative oh, like things a, that can happen. There's a on, blizzard on the date, a blizzard card. Yeah, it it basically works like that card that shuts down beer tents, that kind of thing. That you could similar. To yes, you. yeah. So yeah, winter romance definitely my favorite. I like. It in part because I feel like the artwork is not quite so saucy 
and that we have not just maids, but butlers as well. And so I'm all about the gender equality. So yeah, winter romance, definitely my favorite of the Tonto Quarry expansions. All right. So the last game looks like it could be a Tonto Quarry expansion, but it's actually something else. And it's called Starlight Stage. And I haven't played this for a really long time, and I've only played it a couple times. And what you're doing is you're taking on the role of a talent agency, and you're trying to collect talent. So you're trying to get um, actresses, models, and singers, and all that kind of thing. But the way you're doing that is through, like, the Splendor-style set collection. So this person that I want may take, like, four of the yellow resource. So I need to have four of those yellow cards in my hand to cash those in to be able to recruit this character to come to my my agency to get points. And then once you have them in your agency, then you can level them up. They can go from model to singer to um, actress, I think. Or model actress to singer. That's like the the progression. And you, you can be like a super famous singer depending on how like strong that character was at the beginning. So it's it's like the Splendor style gameplay but a little more like a set collection type of engine building thing you got going on in front of you to score as many points as you can. Again, haven't played it for a long time. It has not as crazy as art as Tondo Core, but still, some of it can be a little risque. But I, it's fine. I would rather play all these other games than this one. But it fits well on the shelf, which is why it's still up there. Um, but if you're looking for a fun Splendor-ish game and you like the music theme, which I do happen to like, maybe check it out if you can find it. Or, you know, I can trade you mine if you want. Um, so, yeah, that's Starlight Stage. Yeah, I've never played this one. I don't know why. Probably because you played with Brandon. You're like, it's not very good. <laughs> yeah, I played it with Brandon and Josie, and I was like, it was fine. I'd rather play Splendor or Space Explorers. That's kind of how I felt about it. Okay, so this shelf was definitely, I feel like this is a niche shelf for us. Because not a lot of people have Heart of Crown or Tanta Cori, And I don't think enough people know about Hagakure. Because if you like trick-taking games, you need to get that one. So were any of these games new to you? Uh, do you have some of these games and can weigh in? Um, do you want to start a fight about Tanto Kore? Let's do it. Find us on social media. We've got the Facebook. We've got hashtag the riveted, the best Facebook group in existence. I don't know. It's pretty okay. Uh, the Instagrams, the uh, the Twitters. We have a TikTok that is not used. I keep thinking I should try to use it. It has two videos. Thank you. Okay. I don't know how to add new TikToks, um, but I have my own TikTok account anyway that I watch stuff on um, because it's funny. Because it's stupid. TikTok is the cesspool of humanity. You watch YouTube videos all day. It's the same thing. They're just shorter. Yeah. And I can actually get something out of a YouTube video like sports. I have gotten all kinds of stuff out of TikTok videos. Okay. Agree to disagree. TikTok taught me. Okay. Hashtag TikTok. Me. Um, but we are on there. We also have a Discord chat. We haven't been chatting a lot lately. I just always don't know what to say. Like, I don't want to annoy people <laughs> because I've heard I'm annoying. Um, and also, our YouTube uh, channel has tons of videos. Jason's so good at putting them out. I need to get better at that. It's my constant, it's my tragic flaw. It's what's holding me back. I need to work on that. But we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, let us know what you think about any of these games or just about any games in general. Are there new things that you're playing, stuff we should check out? We would love to hear from you guys. We played Feudum. We tried MLP. You know, just uh, kind of say hi. We're back. We're back from vacation. That's all I, that's all I really have to say. Yeah, and I was going to try to do a couple more live plays with the youngest daughter because she's been bothering me. So... Uh, stay tuned to that on Facebook. Then they'll be posted to YouTube eventually. But she likes doing some of those. So we'll we'll probably grab a couple games and see what we can knock out. Yeah. Probably not My Little Pony because we went over that earlier. But Maybe Summer Camp once she we'll gets see. it. Yeah, that's true. Could lead to MLP. Who knows? We like to exploit our children. They don't make us any money, though. That's not our bag. I know. I know. Eight and 11 years and still no payoff? Come on. I what are we waiting for? Know it. Well... Thankfully, they were. I've always known the children are not a wise economic investment. Yeah, if you want to just throw money away, sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially if you want to, you know, get involved in cheerleading. Oh my! You'll gosh. never have money again ever. Part of the problem with cheerleading is you keep making 
your own t-shirts and that spending money on that. Not even the money I spend for her own uniform and t-shirts. Because they're funny, okay? They're funny. Jason is hashtag ultimate cheer dad. <laughs> next year, I just, I've already said, next year I'm coaching football. I'm going to coach Pee Wee football while Rory's cheering on the sidelines and Jason's going to be cheer dad in charge of it. He's going to have a megaphone, his own pom-poms. It's coming. I do want some pom-poms. I really do. All right, that's enough for us. You've gotten, <laughs> sorry, this came out late this week. We're back to our usual nonsense. I've been Katie. And I'm Jason. Keep gaming, everybody. Keep gaming. Keep gaming.